Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly updates on innovations and activities in the Department of Surgery. Today I'm lucky enough to be with Kathleen Christians, who's Professor of Surgery in our Division of Surgical Oncology and a real expert in the surgical management of uh, tumors of the liver, pancreas, and, uh, and, and whether they be benign uh, or malignant. And we'll talk about that a bit more uh, in a moment. Kathleen went to medical school at the University of Iowa and then came for her surgical training here at MCW. During her training, she spent uh, many months in England, Scotland, experiencing how surgery is performed uh, in other countries. At the completion of her residency, she then did one fellowship in surgical critical care and then a second fellowship in liver and pancreas surgery at the University of Hong Kong. There have been many innovations in the surgical management of the pancreas and liver in both China and Japan, uh, and uh, a lot of that technology has made its way uh, to the United States. So we, of course, hope that we have also added uh, to the world's list of innovators. Uh, but Kathleen, maybe I could start our conversation talking a little bit about, um, about advanced training since you're, you're kind of the poster child, if you will, for that having trained forever. Um, many in our audience realize that uh, you go to medical school for, for four years, mm -hmm. uh, then do surgical training for anywhere from five to seven or eight years, and then fellowship training on top of that. So it truly is an incredible length of time. But uh, me, there has, have now been a lot of, uh, of work, not only in the, in the uh, published literature that we read in medicine, but also in the lay press on the whole relationship of volume to outcomes, centers of excellence, fellowship training. Maybe you can comment a little bit on, on fellowship training. Right. So I'm the uh, co-director of our HPB fellowship program, which stands for hepatopancreatic biliary surgery, and essentially that's surgery that involves the liver, pancreas, and biliary tree. And uh, the training involved in that is an intense one to two year uh, training program where, whereby the individual is trained in basically all benign and malignant diseases of the liver, pancreas, and biliary tree. And in addition to that, our fellows are also trained in minimally invasive surgery, usually encompassing not only um, laparoscopic surgery, but also robotic surgery. Certainly the, certainly the robot has gotten a, a lot of attention also. Um, and w what is the role for the robot? Maybe first of all, you can explain to our listeners what actually, how you do the surgery through the robot, because obviously the robot does not do the operation, you do the operation, but how you use the, op the robot to do an operation. And then in subsequent videos, we'll probably film you working in a, in a robotic operation, but how does that all work? Okay, so for starters, yes, for sure the surgeon is actually doing the operation. You have uh, one person at the bedside that is passing instruments to and from the robot, and the person who is doing the case is sitting at the console, and you have specific instrumentation that is directly working through the console to do the work at the bedside. So you are actually driving the whole show. And the advantages of robotic surgery is that you have um, wristed motion, so anything that your hands can do or your wrists can do, you can do, as opposed to chopsticks, which are laparoscopic surgery. You have 3D vision as opposed to 2D vision, and it, the robot is really useful for procedures that are in confined spaces where you need high precision, both visualization and um, microscopic type work. So th those are the advantages of the robot. The, in terms of HPB surgery in the robot, um, any surgery can be done with the robot, but I think it's important to note that the robot is just a tool. So you need to know, you need to be able to do the same excellent quality surgery that you would do open as with the robot. So if you're, you can't obtain appropriate margins, you can't obtain appropriate lymph nodes, that, uh, resection, etc., then perhaps that's not the appropriate case for a robot. So um, for instance, the cases such as cystic neoplasms of the pancreas, cholidoco cysts, uh, liver resections, I've done some caudate liver resections. There's uh, specific indications where the robot is excellent and there are other cases such as locally advanced cases where by the tumor may be wrapped on multiple major blood vessels that it might not be worth the effort, so to speak, to dock the robot. So there, that is uh, 
somewhat surgeon dependent, but it also has to do with the quality of the operation that you're doing. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, uh, every, all of us associate new with better, right? I mean, we do that uh, even if we're buying a car. We associate something, a, a new model or a new innovation with actually being better. And I think it's, imp it's virtually impossible for the lay public not to do that with medicine. So what you're saying really is that there are certain operations for which the robot or the laparoscopic approach is helpful and beneficial. And there are certain operations where making an, if you will, old time incision is the safest, best approach. Exactly. Right? That's exactly. Certainly with cancer, the outcome that is so hard to measure but uh, is so critically important is the length and quality of life of the patient. Right. And for that, the cancer operation needs to always be done, be done really well. Exactly, so the, it trumps how you do the operation is absolutely critical. So you need to make sure no matter what modality you use, the final outcome is what you're there to achieve. So. One of the areas that uh, Dr. Christians is a true expert in is neuroendocrine tumors. They can arise anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract but are particularly uh, prone to occur in the pancreas. Uh, Stephen Jobs was probably one of the most famous people to develop a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas or a, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. What separates that from the typical kind of pancreatic cancer that, for example, Luciano Pavarotti um, got or uh, Patrick Swayze had the more traditional type of pancreas cancer? Stephen Jobs, a different kind. Maybe you can explain that to, to right. us. Right, so pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors arrive from different type of cell in the pancreas. So a, a neuroendocrine tumor arrives from endocrine cells or islet cell t uh, of the pancreas as opposed to from the exocrine system where the garden variety adenocarcinoma arises from. From the standpoint of how the uh, tumors appear on imaging, they're completely different. Neuroendocrine tumors are uh, classically hypervascular or they light up on early arterial phases and, and uh, they're frequently well circumscribed and they not always but usually do not invade. They tend to more push. So in these types of tumors are some, uh, for a good example, are a, a classic for robotic type surgery, or sometimes uh, more well suited for that. Um, the other uh, key to neuroendocrine tumors is that patients are typically long lived. Um, they tend to live much longer than patients with adenocarcinoma, and so you have to make sure that your treatment's not worse than the disease. So for instance, if you have a pancreatic uh, tumor in the tail of the pancreas and you have a liver metastasis situated right in the middle of the right lobe, you would not uh, necessarily want to do a complete right hepatic lobectomy for a small one centimeter tumor in the middle of the liver because that would be over treatment for a disease in a patient that would otherwise be long lived. So it's Because the tumor may actually come back exactly. in, the, in the other side of the liver and then the right side is gone even though the the left side may have hypertrophied or gotten a little bit bigger, correct? Exactly. So this is a classic example why multidisciplinary care is so important because we often involve all the other disciplines. So sometimes we will um, also involve chemotherapy depending on uh, the uh, KI-67 of the patient. Sometimes we'll involve interventional radiology and do Y90 or TACE. So it truly crosses the disciplines and it's very important that uh, basically, everyone is involved in the patient and talking at various phases of care to deliver the appropriate treatment because you certainly do not want to burn bridges early in these types of patients. Yeah, and with so many options, you simply need a large enough program to make all of those options possible, which I think is, is something you've developed here, which is, is really fantastic. You know, it's, it's fascinating when you look back at the history of how healthcare has evolved. Initially, um, the doctors were put in in their areas of specialization and because the treatment options for various diseases especially cancers were relatively limited that seemed to make sense and it probably was in the 19 late 1980s early 1990s when it became in, intuitively obvious to all of us that we really need to practice medicine based upon the problem that the patient has not the specialty of the physicians and I think what Dr. Christians is articulating very accurately is the importance of bringing all of the different specialists to the patient's problem even though by necessity 
some will have trained in surgery, some will have trained in medical oncology, in radiology, et cetera. Exactly. Um, what do you do for the patient who has a pancreatic tumor, be it adenocarcinoma or the regular kind of cancer or a neuroendocrine tumor that is just not, just, it's too big to remove. It cannot be safely removed, but there doesn't look to be cancer in other parts of the body. Well, so, I mean, it does depend on the tissue type somewhat, but obviously these patients, first of all, we need to make sure that the patients are accurately staged. So we do um, thin cut pancreas protocol CTs or high quality MRI to get the exact staging. And then we put the patient in a bucket such as resectable, borderline resectable, or locally advanced. And that uh, gives us a particular pathway in which we are going to take the patient from beginning to end with the goal of eventually, hopefully, resecting the patient if possible. And so um, we have set criteria that were developed elsewhere and here um, in terms of what is considered resectable, borderline, or locally advanced. And then we look particularly at each of the blood vessels and what the person's particular anatomy is and uh, determine from there whether or not they're able to be resected and what part of the phase of care is that going to be. Now we do favor neoadjuvant therapy here, meaning chemotherapy and or chemoradiation prior to surgery. We have found that uh, we are able to deliver all modalities of therapy if we do it in that manner and we, uh, the patients are much longer lived. And uh, so we are uh, major proponents of that at this institution and we've had some excellent results and have written extensively about it here. Great. Well, we've only really scratched the surface of uh, how to manage pancreatic and liver tumors. Uh, I know that uh, the audience will be provided information to contact Dr. Christians, send us an email uh, or any other method of uh, social media communication, and we'll produce a short video that may be specifically uh, designed to address those individual questions. I think uh, certainly the medical community of southeastern Wisconsin is well aware of Dr. Christian's incredible talent technically in the operating room, and I think hopefully that will become uh, 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 of wider distribution as many people see um, media outlets such as this. So Kathleen, thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us. Thank you. And we'll, we'll be back to you again soon. Great, thank you.